Welcome to the third of three video lectures on Matthew Quick's young adult novel, Forgive Me Leonard Peacock. In this video lecture, we will cover chapters 24 through the end of the novel. I'll focus on uh, Asher Beale and also on Herr Silverman uh, and their relationships with Leonard, how those relationships develop and drive the, the plot in the story. Uh, so starting with uh, Asher Beale, actually before we start with Asher Beale, I just want to take a quick moment and point out one more Hamlet reference that you might have recognized. Uh, so at the beginning of chapter 25, we've got uh, Leonard outside of Asher Beale's home um, with the gun, ready to commit a murder. And we have him thinking back in this really dark moment uh, to Hamlet. And he says, what dreams may come, which is a line from the to be or not to be speech from Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet and Lauren would, would ask. Um, and also there's a, a footnote here. Footnote 55 also refers back to Macbeth. Uh, so if you go to the footnotes, you can see a Macbeth reference as well. So uh, Leonard normally references Hamlet. Uh, one short reference to Macbeth as well. And, and a rather fitting passage, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player, and, and so on. Uh, all right, so so he's sitting there. And, and as he is, is, he's outside of Asher's window, uh, we finally get a sense of what, the animosity. What, what's happened that's caused Leonard to want to hurt Asher? Uh, and he goes into the story. Uh, you'll remember the Green Day concert from earlier in the book, the flashback. Uh, this is page 179 in your book. A few months after we went to the Green Day concert, Asher spent the weekend with his uncle Dan fishing somewhere in rural Pennsylvania. I think it might have been the Poconos. He loved his uncle Dan who was tall and confident and funny and drove a cool truck and was always taking Asher places, like to the movies and car races and even hunting. Uncle Dan seemed like the kind of uncle every kid dreams of having. I remember liking him immediately when we first met. He really seemed like a great guy, which makes it all the worse. Uh, so we'll skip ahead just a little bit here as we analyze this. Um, well, and... and it's not absolutely explicit uh, what Uncle Dan uh, has done, um, but I think it's, it's clear all the same. Uh, Uncle Dan has sexually abused Asher um, on this camping trip, um, and as a result, Asher comes back broken from the trip. Uh, and here we have in the next chapter uh, some, some more memories of, of Leonard remembering what happened after the trip and the ways in which Asher was broken. I'm standing in the target's window now, remembering what he did to me in that very bedroom so many times. Uh, so remember the, the incident with Uncle Dan happened when, the, the, when Asher was 12, when both boys were 12. Uh, they're now 18, uh, so six years in between. And in that time in between, there were two years uh, where, where Asher did, sexual, did committed acts of sexual violence against Leonard, which he describes in these chapters. I'm standing in the target's window now, remembering what he did to me in that very bedroom so many times. How confused I felt. How I wanted it to stop. How he intimidated me. How he psychologically tricked me. How he said if I stopped doing what we were doing, he'd tell people in great detail all about what we had done together. And then everyone would call me a faggot and maybe even beat the shit out of me. People would believe him and not me when he said I made him do it. And how if I stopped doing what he wanted me to do, he'd post a video he secretly made of us with his computer camera that I didn't know was on. Uh, recording acts of, um, recording sex acts and then blackmailing someone with them is a felony. <laughs> At least in the state of Missouri is a felony. The first time he said his uncle had shown him how to feel good in a way I wouldn't believe. I wanted to feel good. Who doesn't? We were almost 12. So actually, I guess they were 11. I said 12 a moment ago. They would have been 11, almost 12. We were wrestling, WWE style, just messing around. I had the ski mask I'd wear and pretend I was Rey Mysterio. He was always John Cena. And then we weren't wrestling. We were doing something I didn't understand, something exciting, dangerous, something I wasn't ready for, something I didn't really want. We were pretending. Or were we? Then Asher wanted to wrestle all the time. I started asking questions, trying to figure out what was happening. Asher told me not to ask questions, to keep what happened between us, not to think about it too much. And he looked mean when he said it, like someone I didn't know, not like a friend at all. The more it happened, the less friendly he got. It went on for two years. I didn't want to lose my friend. 
Haven't you ever done things you didn't want to do just to keep a friend? So we're, we're analyzing Asher here and we're thinking about Asher's character. Um, and I think it's really easy to vilify Asher. He, and, he, and, and rightfully so. What he does to Leonard for two years is traumatizing and terrible. Um, and at the same time, I want us to remember that, though, in the context of what Uncle Dan does to Asher. Um, and we see in this, this cycle of violence committed starting with Uncle Dan, and we don't know Uncle Dan's story, so maybe there was something there that started before. We see these cycles where, where violence is perpetuated um, in circles, and it keeps going. Um, and there's just something really, really ugly and dark and painful here as we think about the this, this cycle of violence. And, and here we have uh, Leonard remembering this as he waits outside Asher's window with a, with a gun. Um, all right, scooting ahead just a little bit. And I think I didn't highlight the next little passage I wanted. Oh, yeah, no, I, I did, I did. Um, this, the, this is right here. So, so what I want to, what I want to, I, I picked. I, there's, there's several points we could, we could point out, point to right here. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. This, there's, this is so good. I could just sit here and read this to you and, and really enjoy it. Um, but but I won't because you've already read it and because that, that's not what we do in here. Um, but um, this is there there are moments of hope throughout the book, um, and in one we find that in one moment of hope, even though it's very dark as Leonard's outside that window, he cannot bring himself to kill Asher. He cannot bring himself to shoot him, um, and 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 that's that's hopeful. That's, that's, that's a moment where Leonard's able, to, I think, to overcome something. He's going to wrestle later with whether or not this is a moment of weakness or strength. And I would argue wholeheartedly it's a moment of strength. Finding yourself incapable of enacting revenge. Finding yourself incapable of acting, uh, enacting violence against somebody. That's a good attribute. That's a good characteristic. If you are unable to hurt another person, even if in your own even if you could argue that they deserve to be hurt, but you can't do it. That's something to admire. Uh, so he says here, uh, maybe this is all my fault. Uh, this is after he's, he's left. Maybe I should have killed Asher Beale. I mean, I was so angry. Asher definitely deserved to die. Or, and I think this is an important line, maybe I should have tried to save Asher back when all the bad shit began before he turned full on evil. But I was just a kid. We were just kids, and maybe we still are. You can't expect kids to save themselves, can you? I've got the gun to my temple now, and I'm rubbing the side of my head into the metal O. Uh, I think that's an interesting moment uh, where, where Leonard thinks back to if he, and he contemplates, could he have ever saved Asher? Uh, and he writes it off as he was just a kid, so, so he couldn't. Um, and, and to a certain degree... Sure, I, I buy that. Uh, but also, on, on an, to a, in another from another perspective, um, I'm pleased to hear him thinking through another end, another possible outcome that could have happened. Um, and I think there, that again is another symbol of hope to cling to as as we get closer to the end of the novel. I definitely want to point out this footnote here. Um, because it relates back to Hamlet, and you all know by this point, one of the reasons I love this novel is because Matthew Quick leans so heavily on Hamlet um, and our understanding of Hamlet. Um, it makes me think about how Hamlet had had the chance to kill Claudius while he was praying, but didn't since Claudius had just made peace with God, asked for God's forgiveness, and therefore was eligible for entrance into heaven, as Lauren will tell you. So Hamlet waited for a long time when Claudius was sinning. Um, so I like I like that connection. I like thinking about Hamlet unable to kill Claudius, and also here we have Leonard unable to kill Asher. Um, and I think in both those characters, uh, that is a, that is a, a characteristic that inability to to commit murder um, in this moment is a strength. And it's complicated. And I could go on, and we could go really into a tangent talking about Hamlet um, and why he doesn't kill Claudius in that moment, and whether or not he would have um, a couple of scenes later. And it is complicated. Um, so I'm simplifying it a bit. Um, but here, when when Leonard needs to remember earlier in the book, he he referred to Hamlet when he was with Mrs. Giavatella in chapter 12, referred to Hamlet as a hero, somebody he should emulate, and he chose this 
moment to emulate Hamlet, this idea of Hamlet not being willing uh, to commit a murder, uh, even if the other person perhaps deserved it, even if the other person had done extensive, some, some extensive, some great wrong. Let's jump back to the, the main text. I'm just about to pull the trigger when another random question pops into my head. I wonder whether Linda ever remembered that it was my that it was my birthday. For some reason it seems important right now and the more I wonder the more I realize I just can't die without knowing the answer. Again, I, I see that as a moment of hope. Um, I'm searching deep for these moments of hope perhaps in these lines uh, but this idea of he needs to know something he needs to know he needs to, to 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 cling on to something alive whether or not his mom remembered it was his birthday or not um we're gonna find out she didn't his, the, the mom does not is not a good character um she's not a good mom i i, I wanted to feel sorry for her but it's very hard and, and will as you know from having finished the book at the very end but uh for some reason it seems important right now and the more i wonder the more i realize i just can't die without knowing the answer i lower the p38 and check my phone for voice messages there are none I check my email. Nothing. Nor are there any text messages. I laugh. I mean, I effing howl because it seems so fitting somehow. What a birthday it's been. What a life. Scoot that down just a little bit. I raise the P38 and press the mouth into my temple once more. I close my eyes. I squeeze the trigger. Uh, this last line, I've said before, Leonard is an unreliable narrator. And, and this is my reading. And we can we can argue about this reading, and I'm actually very curious what you think. Uh, I don't think he actually squeezes the trigger. I think he says he does, but I don't think he actually did it. Uh, and here and here's why. Let's let's move on. Um, th these are I love the way that these pages are laid out. Uh, time comes to a standstill. Five pages for just a, a what five words or a couple a few more than that. All right, and here's why I don't think he actually pulled the trigger. Let me move this back out of the way. Uh, the trigger resists, resists, and I wonder if it might be rusted or something. Because no matter how hard I squeeze, the bullet doesn't come out, and I do not die. Okay, so he says he's pulling the trigger, and he says no matter how hard he pulls it, it doesn't shoot. And maybe you could argue against me and say the gun really was rusty. It's from World War II. It's a really old gun. It's at least 75, 80 years old. Um, it doesn't work anymore. You can pull the trigger and nothing happens. Maybe that's the case. Um, and maybe Leonard, and, and if you do take that argument, then maybe Leonard knew it was rusted and that it wouldn't work too. Um, and if you take that side of that, that argument, then, then, then maybe there's even a little bit of hope there. He never intended to kill himself uh, because uh, he knew that the gun would, would not work. Um, but I don't think that's the case either. I don't think he actually pulled the trigger. Um, so I transfer the gun into my left hand and try to straighten my tr trigger finger and find that I can't. So he says I can't when he switches hands. He says his finger's not moving. It's sort of frozen in a cat's curled tail position that I cannot alter. Ugh! I scream into the night across the water and then bang my fist against the concrete wall trying to get my trigger finger to work. But no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to blow my brains out. I wonder if my inability is some sort of subconscious attempt to save myself from suicide. And I, and I think that's actually now we hear, I think, the truth. I think that the, the truth is revealed in this line. Um, it's an inability. It's my inability to pull the trigger. I don't think he ever tried to, he physically never actually pulled that trigger. Uh, that's my reading on it, and, and you have to interpret. You, the, but it's not explicit. It's not clear uh, whether he actually, whether that trigger moved or not. Um, I think he didn't, he didn't actually move his finger, um, but that's, a re that's, a, that's an interpretation, and there's nothing in the text that, that proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, I remember that I promised to at least call Hare Silverman if I was ever about to end my life, if I was about to end my life. So I figure I maybe have to make good on that promise before my subconscious will allow me to employ my trigger finger and finish the job. Promise is a promise. Now he calls Hare Silverman and he gets Hare Silverman involved. Hare Silverman had given his number. Hare Silverman throughout the book has been a hero to uh, to Leonard. So if in some sense Hamlet is a literary hero, Hare Silverman's actually a real person uh, in his life who can be a hero, to, who is a hero to him. And I think Hare Silverman in the, in the next chapters proves himself a hero, although I think Hare Silverman also should have asked for help 
um, and gotten more help than he did. Uh, so I don't think Harris Silverman himself is without flaw. Every character in this book is flawed to a degree, and in Hare Silverman too. Um, scooting on, let me jump to just a moment here. And let me scoot this over. Um, so throughout the book, uh, Leonard has been curious about why uh, Hare Silverman never rolls his sleeves up. Why does he not ever expose his arms in school? Even on warm days, he always has a long sleeve covering his arms. And we found out it's because he has a pink triangle tattoo, the, the kind that were put on homosexuals uh, under the Nazi regime to mark them as homosexuals. And, not, and he has one of these tattoos on his arm. And instead of letting anyone ever, anyone in school see that or know that he has that tattoo, he always keeps his arms covered. Uh, and I think that's an important moment in the, in the novel, not only because Matthew Quick is introducing us to a homosexual character in a young adult novel, and it's important that homosexual characters uh, receive attention in young adult novels and ad adult novels as well. So it's important for that reason, but also it drives the, the plot in some important ways and, th and the characterization as well. It, it lends a, a deep kind of insight into Harris Silverman's maturation and development as a human being. Uh, and so let's read. Um, so why don't you show your students your tattoo? Because it might hinder my ability to get an important message to people who need it. What's the message? And remember, uh, this, at this moment, um, they're down by the river. It's dark. It's it's nighttime. Uh, Leonard is is very close to suicide, uh, and and Harris Silverman has taken a cab there to be there and try to prevent him. So this is is a very dark moment, both literally because it's at nighttime, but also metaphorically. What's the message? It's the message of my classes, especially my Holocaust class. But what is it? What do you think it is? That it's okay to be different? We should be tolerant? That's part of it. So why not be different and promote tolerance by showing everyone your pink triangle? Because that might make it difficult for some of your classmates to take me and my message seriously. It's sort of don't ask, don't tell for gay high school teachers. Especially those of us who teach controversial Holocaust classes, Herr Silverman says. And then starts rolling up his other sleeve almost all the way to his armpit. Here, use my phone to read this. So now he's showing him his other arm, his other tattoo. I transfer the P38 to my left hand and take hold of his cell phone. I run, so he still has the gun in his hand even. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining being Herr Silverman and just how, what a difficult situation he's in in this moment. And, and, and as a result, why he's a hero, um, but also just what a difficult, difficult situation he's in, in terms of figuring out what the right thing to do is. Anyway, he rolls his other arm up. Um, I run the light up the inside of his entire arm. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Uh, and so this is the other side of his arm, and this is his this message, right? Uh, all right, let's jump ahead. Um, and so here's Herr Silverman on the next page, uh, talking Leonard down, right? Um, and, he, and Leonard has said in the, the lines before, he's got a gun pointing it that toward himself. He says, this is who I am. Um, and he says, I raise the P-38 to my head and say, this is me right here, right now. No, it's not you at all. How would you even know? Because I've read your essays. Remember Mrs. Giovatella in chapter 12 read his essay on Hamlet and how good it was. Um, here, Harris Silverman saying, I've read those essays and I've looked into your eyes when I lecture. I can tell you get it. You're different. And I know how hard being different can be, but I also know how powerful a weapon being different can be. How the world needs such weapons. Gandhi was different. All great people are. And unique people such as you and me need to seek out other unique people who understand so we don't get too lonely and end up where you did tonight. And, and Leonard gets this message. This, this, this goes deep. But he's also really confused and he has this part that follows where he, he insists he's not gay. Um, I'm not gay, I say. And he says, you don't have to be gay to be different. He keeps repeating, I'm not gay, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. Um, and, and finally says, why do you keep saying that over and over again? Well, Asher Beal is. Um, and I don't know if Asher Beal actually is gay or not. Um, Asher Beal um, suffered his own trauma. And I, Asher Beal has done terrible things, but uh, I want to be careful. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to I, I think deeply about these characters as full individuals as well. And Asher Beal has done awful, awful things. Um, but I don't know that he's necessarily... Act I don't know. I don't know. Um, He's not gay like you. He's horrible. Um, 
And then he goes on, and Leonard tells him everything. Um, I tell him everything. Every horrible, stomach-wrenching detail. Um, Herr Silverman ends up talking him down. He's got a great line. I didn't highlight it in here, so I probably can't find it quickly. He's got a great line where, what you know, what should I do with the gun? Um, and Herr Silverman has a great line. Oh, I don't see it right here. Um... Yeah, I don't see it right here, but the but the line. Oh, here it is. Throw the gun in the river, Leonard. Trust in the future. Go ahead. It's okay. Things are going to get better. You can do the work. Um, he chucks it into the river, like a boomerang. Um, anyway, there was there's a line I really like where he says, "As far as I'm concerned, all guns belong at the bottom of rivers." Um, and I really like that line um, for this moment, especially of getting rid of this this dangerous weapon. All guns belong at the bottom of rivers. I, I like that line a lot. Anyway, um, so Herr Silverman does something here too that can he continues to do what he needs to do to make sure Leonard's safe. But in doing so, he continues to put himself at great risk. And even Leonard recognizes that. Um, he takes him home with him. And that's something a teacher really should never do. He really should have called for help at this point. Um, and, and again, this is my reading of the text, but he should have called for help. There's a system in place to protect children like Leonard, and he should have leaned on it. At the same time, I also realize the counter-argument to that then is if he would have done that, Leonard wouldn't have trusted him, and maybe he couldn't have saved Leonard, and maybe the system couldn't have saved Leonard. Um, so we can. Th this is a really tough ethical question, right? Hare Silverman does his ethical question day in his Holocaust class where he asks students to ask really difficult ethical questions. Um, I come down on the side of he shouldn't have taken him home, but I certainly can see the argument where he needed to do it too. I don't know the right answer to this. This is a really difficult one. Um, but as a teacher, as a former high school teacher, former middle school teacher, uh, the idea of taking a student home and having them spend the night with you, and particularly the fact that Harris Silverman is homosexual, um, puts him at e even greater risk um, of, of being accused of having done something uh, wrong, right? Um, so it's a very difficult question. All right, uh, moving on. I want to jump to the end now. Let me keep moving just a little bit here. Uh, and I want to keep the, on this theme of, of hope. Let me scoot that down just a little bit. This theme of hope at the end of the novel. And I, I, and I like to ask people after they get to the end, you know, do you find that, are you satisfied with the ending? And do you see hope at the ending? And I'll, uh, I'll share my thoughts on that, but I'm, but I'm curious about you, whether or not you found satisfaction with the ending, whether or not you see hope here. Um, so I'll ask you, take a moment now before I dive in too deeply into mine, but, but think about that question. Is, there, is it a hopeful ending or is it rather um, problematic? in ways. Is it problematic in the sense that Leonard could still, Leonard might still not have the support that he needs and that he still is in danger of suicide, right? He still has some of those mental health issues that, that were there the day before. They haven't gone away. And, and this is the counter argument to what I'm about to say, that the argument that there isn't very much hope at the end. Um, that would be that, uh, that, that Leonard still has these same mental health problems. They haven't gone away and there's no indication that he has the right support in place yet for them. Uh, anyway, but, but here's where I do see hope. Um, so here's uh, balancing those ideas, right? There's not a straightforward black and white answer to the end of this. Uh, this is the next day, uh, the next morning. He decided to skip school, um, as he often does, and he is with Walt, and they're watching bogey movies, which is something peaceful for, for Leonard. My eyes glaze over, and I zone out, mostly thinking about how close I came to killing Asher and myself last night, how it almost seemed like I was watching a movie when I had the gun pointed at my classmate, like it wasn't even real, how effed up scary that seems now that my head is straight. As I sit here next to Walt, I feel kind of grateful for this moment, strange as that sounds. Like, I just narrowly avoided some awful, demented fate. So I see hope here because, well, he says, I feel kind of lucky. I see hope here in the idea that he has, he has moved on from that really dangerous moment he was in the night before. He, for the whole day, his whole 18th birthday. He, he, and, he even, and he feels good about having moved on. So we see a change here. It worries me that I can be so explosive one day, volatile enough to commit a murder-suicide, and then the next day I'm watching Bogart save the day with Walt like nothing happened at all and nothing is urgent, and I really don't have to do anything to set the world right or escape my own mind. I'd like to feel all okay all the time. Um, 
So again, there, this is a mixed message of whether or not this is hope or not. But the fact that he wants to heal says a lot to me personally. Uh, it says a lot to me that, that he he wishes that he, could, he, he that he so badly wants to get to this point. And I know I'm, I'm not a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, so I'm not really qualified to, to, other than just as a lay person making comments um, or, or reactions to this. But to me, that sounds hopeful. I see hope in that, that idea of wanting things to get better. And I, I know that it is at, for, for someone who's, who's struggling with mental health, it's more complicated than just wanting to be better. Just wanting to be better is not enough, all right? So I feel like I'm going back and forth between this argument. I'm wrestling with my, my myself on whether or not there's hope at the ending of this. Um, and I, I really do see both sides of, of that, that argument. All right, let's, um, let's, let's just jump forward a little bit further. And I just want to highlight a couple other points where I, I see hope at the end. Am I better than last night? I don't know. But I don't feel angry anymore. So I see hope in those lines. And then down here at the, to close out the chapter, maybe Walt knows me better than anyone else in the world, as strange as that sounds. Maybe we've been communicating effectively through Bogart-related quotes all along. Maybe I'm better than I thought when it comes to communication, at least with people like Walt. And maybe there are other people like Walt out there waiting for me to find them. Maybe. Uh, so I see hope here too, right? He sees, he sees a, a, a future in which he's there with other people, not alone, and with people he can communicate with, and he's he knows it's worth. He says it's worth looking for, right? There's hope to me there. Uh, let's let's scroll on. I want to jump down. Um, I, I I included this passage too. This passage just really struck me on my first reading. So I've read through this novel now several times. I've written about this novel. I've taught this novel. Um, it's been a really powerful book uh, for, for me, even as an adult. Obviously, I, was, I never read as a young adult because I'm too old. Um, but, but as an adult, it, it just keeps me thinking in a lot of powerful ways. Um, and this part, on my very first reading, I still have the note in my, my physical book, and I put crying point. Um, so sometimes books make you cry, and sometimes books definitely make me cry. Um, and when I got to this line in my very first reading, um, since I've read it multiple times now. Um, it doesn't necessarily strike as hard as it did the first time, but this, this was a line um, that brought tears to my eyes. I pour some batter. He's, he's making the, the pa banana pancakes for his mom, and she's just zoned out again, completely ignoring. I pour some batter onto the pan, and it bubbles and sizzles while I pour out three more pancakes. I flip all four and then heat up the oven so I can keep the finished pancakes warm while I cook mom's. Linda? No answer. Mom? No answer. And that was, for me, the first time I read that was just, yeah, that was a tearjerker. All right. Uh, and, oh, and one last bit. Um, he has one last letter from the future. I haven't spent a, very much time at all talking about the letters from the future in these video lectures. And I, I uh, there's just so much to say um, that I've skipped over these. Um, uh, but um, that's, I, uh, th I love these letters from the future. And I love the world he creates, everything about them. And... I think that we have, oops, I shouldn't have moved that a minute ago. Let me put it back. Uh, and I think we see hope at the end. Uh, he, they're, you know, they're in Philadelphia and, and they're living on the, um, in this post-apocalyptic world um, in which the oceans have risen in this world. And this is his daughter, his young daughter, and it's her 18th birthday. And she's writing this letter from her 18th birthday back to him the day after his 18th birthday. Uh, I've watched you sleep for over, over an hour just because. And the whole time I wished your mind was a sea we could scuba dive in together because I'd l like to see the love statue in Philadelphia uh, that sits at the bottom of your consciousness. I know it's huge and red and beautiful because you've been pulling the seaweed off it for so many years. I know you weeded the waters of your mind for me, for mom, the idea of weeding the waters of his mind, right? That means getting better. That means healing, um, like weeding a garden to pull the weeds out. To so it can grow. The same thing, he's been weeding his mind, is the metaphor here, um, so that he can go, get to his future. I know you've weeded the waters of your mind for me, for mom, so we could celebrate my 18th birthday together, and so I could go on and enjoy the life you gave me. Keep weeding, Dad. Weed your mind and man the great light, the, the lighthouse, even when no one is looking. Even when no one is looking, keep going. Love your daughter, 
S. So, and, and those are the closing lines of the book. And I think one more, one example um, where I see hope at the end. All right, that brings us to the end of the, the video lecture series for Forgive Me, Leonard Peacock. I hope you've enjoyed the journey through this novel together with me as much as I've enjoyed this book uh, and look forward to hearing in class uh, more of your ideas uh, as we close out the, the unit. All right, thank you, everybody.